every team has their own wrestler. But this is for wrestlers everywhere. Wrestle hard. All right, welcome back to the new Mindset Monday podcast <coughs> brought to you by Wrestling Mindset, the only wrestling-specific mindset training program anywhere in the world. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and make sure to mention today's podcast with Nick Simmons when you sign up for a free trial session at WrestlingMindset.com. This is Mindset Mike, and I'm joined today by one of my favorite guys in the sport of wrestling. As a New Yorker myself and someone who loved breaking people on top, I watched our guest today make a career striking fear into his opponent's hearts and take their souls in the top position. With 178 pins in high school, he became known as the East Lansing Strangler, coining the phrase, they either go over or they go out. We'll talk about his insatiable desire for pins, pain, and points, the mindset of a pinner, his undefeated high school career, beating some of the best guys in the world, college recruiting, and some of the unfinished business in his competitive career along with his new club. So let's welcome today's guest, Nick Simmons. Nick, how are you doing today, buddy? Good. Thanks for having me this morning. Oh, man, I'm excited to have you. Um, so I, it sounds like you got a beautiful day out there in East Lansing, Michigan. Oh, yeah, sitting on my deck with my coffee right now. There we go. That's the life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everyone knows you're a pinner, right? And you've always been known for that. In high school, you had a perfect 211-0 victory with 178 pins, 208 falls, so obviously, your desire to pin started at a young age. Um, where yep. or where or who did that come from, and how did that evolve? Uh, well, I, our our dad, my dad, instilled that in me when we were growing up wrestling. You know, I was never one that could, uh, you know, take someone down and just keep cutting them. And uh, I started my wrestling was in it made me wrestle weird when I was actually competing when I was doing that. So he was always just like, nope, take him down, pin him, get it over with. Which Andy was totally opposite. Andy, that worked into his wrestling. It just wasn't right for me. You know, so and so. Instilling that at a young age, and that's what I do with my club kids, is instill that top toughness mentality. Go out there, work for the tech, and work for the pin. Absolutely. It makes so wrestling a lot easier. It, it does. I mean, you take him down, he just never gets out. I mean, MMA, that's the that's kind of the formula. You see the successful guys, you they they they, they take the they take the guy down. The only reason if they get up is if they made a mistake. Versus right. everybody's trying to be Jordan Burroughs and take 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 people down and let them up. And that's just a lot more work, man. Oh, it's a lot more work. Take him down, get it over with. It's my motto. Yeah. So with uh, so your your dad instilled this in wrestling. What was your dad's yeah. wrestling background? Uh, he was a two-time state champ from our high school, three-time finalist. He, uh, had a brief stint at Michigan State and then, uh, moved to Texas, actually, where Andy and I were born for a job. Yeah, little known fact, the, uh, the, uh, pinning machines were actually born in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> down, down south, not in Michigan. And then you guys moved back. When did you move back? Oh, real young, you know, three, four. There wasn't wrestling down there back then. Yeah, no, and there really still isn't. <laughs> so uh, you and your brother, correct me if I'm wrong, were both undefeated in high school. So what made you guys yep. so good besides, you know, hard work, being good on top, and, you know, the, the basic tangibles of a, of a champion? What, what, what made you guys so good? Uh, just the opportunities our father was giving us, you know. We, and we had each other to beat up on throughout our whole lives, you know, just making each other tougher. I wasn't going to let him beat me, and, you know, he, he wanted to beat the big brother. So it just those heads clashing like that all the time just, you know, made us what we were. And then the, all the other practice partners that came along with us, you know, so and just it was fun at a young age too, you know. I bet. Who were some of the guys? I know I've heard, you know, you've told me some of the, some of the people. Who were some of the, the coaches and partners that you had growing up? I mean – that was our biggest coach, you know, and then just a bunch of local kids that ended up being, you know, multiple time state champions and going to college or whatever. Just everyone just kind of coming in and out of the room or, you know, down to our basement and stuff and working out with us and doing whatever we had to do to get the workouts in, you know, like most like most parents do nowadays. You know? For sure. So we had we had the Simmons Academy in wrestling before it started last year. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, a couple of my coaches grew up in the basement with us, wrestling. Which ones were those? Uh, ben Giles and Billy Devine, you know, state placers, 
in high school in Michigan, but they just kind of grew up in, in our basement. So they get it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, you know, they, they, they have the same thought process. They have the same moves. They understand <laughs> what you're looking for. So that's an ideal coaching situation for sure. Right. So great wrestlers don't want to win. They want to dominate. And for someone that has the desire to pin, uh, what, what kind of mindset did you come into your matches with and how is that different from the average wrestler? So essentially, you know, what's the difference between trying to win, hoping to pin and hunting for pins? What did you come into your matches? What kind of mindset? That I am going to pin or tech you. I am going to get the fall. I am going to get the bonus points for our team. You know, just that mentality in general. And if you're setting yourself up like that, and if it doesn't happen, if I don't pin you, maybe I will be getting the tech. If I don't get the tech, I'll get the major. And instead of just going out there with the mentality to win where it might be a close match and you could possibly end up on the wrong side of that if you're going out there to dominate the whole time. If you, if you end up short that match, it's not going to be on the losing end of it. Right, exactly. If that makes sense. No, for sure. I mean, even if you lose, if you're going out there with the intention to dominate, you give everything that you can, you're trying to pin tech the entire time, and you still lose, that's right. still a win. I mean, you can't be upset right. with that. And you know, the likelihood is that it's, it, it's funny you said it the way that you did, because that's exactly how I explain it. You know, we'll, we'll talk about Penn State here in a second. Penn State goes out there with the intention to pin. They'll settle with the tech, they'll be pissed with the major, and they'll be furious right. with the decision. You know? Right. I'm sure, the, you know, the handful of times in, in high school where you didn't get a pin or a tech, I'm sure you were pissed. Oh, yeah. I, I got a tech in the state finals my sophomore year, broke my pin streak. I came out. I had, like, tears in my eyes. I was so mad and upset. <laughs> the reporter, I, I remember it vividly. My dad was standing there. The reporter asked me if I was happy for winning this, my second state title. And I was like, no, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm mad that I didn't get the fall. Dude broke my streak. That's funny. That's funny. I mean, but that, but, but like, that's the difference. You know, those are the true champions. I feel like I was talking about um, Adeline Gray stopped by my wrestling room in Houston the other day. And I was talking to people. I said, listen, there are a lot of good wrestlers that work really hard. I was like, if you watched Adeline for that last hour and a half, you would see why she won three world medals. Like that girl didn't break position. That girl was laser focused the entire time. She was asking questions. She was humble. She was uh, aggressive, relentless in every single part of her drilling. Uh, even yeah. in her strength and conditioning. And like I said, to go back to you, when guys like you and guys like Spencer Lee can walk off a mat because I didn't <clears> pin them <throat> or Spencer Lee in the state finals, I didn't tech them fast enough. You know, right. that's, that's the level that these kids need to chase. Like chase that and then settle with something a little farther below versus let me just go out there and I hope that I win, you know? Right. You know, and that's, that's just a, a mentality that – evolved over you know since i've been five years old competing and it was kind of instilled in me and that's the way i kind of approach my coaching style too so with this success... what i do with my kids and that's that was a, a major thing with taylor walsh when i first got there was just he had the he was always a pinner and he always had you know he always had the funk and all that other stuff is it was the mentality that i had to change in him and instill in him just the mind thought instead of hoping to catch it just go get it. Hunt it. Yep. Hunt go it. for it. Nobody goes out hunting deer, like hoping to find a deer. That's the word hunting. Like you are a hunting deer. So if you hunt pins, if you hunt falls, it, it, it'll present itself. And if it doesn't, you'll settle with a close second in there. You know right. what I mean? So what, what advice can you give? You know, obviously that was very successful for you growing up. What advice can you give to wrestlers and parents that are trying to instill a successful mindset in their kids now? Because obviously you were successful and now the kids that you're coaching are very successful. So share some thoughts. Well, it's just uh, how we approach things, you know, how I approach things with the kids and stuff. Or it depends, you know, and especially little kids. Their mindsets are going to be a little bit different. We have to keep up fun with them. But at the same time, the moves that we're showing them and the mentality is, like you said, you're hunting. Don't hope to fall into a win. Don't, you know, don't sit back and wait to fall into that. Go take it. Make it, you know, dominate. Absolutely. I mean, J Jordan Burroughs says it. He says, either you're going to take it from them or they're going to take it from you. Either you're going to crush their dreams or they're going to crush yours. There's no in between. So if you're hunting something, you'll settle with something pretty close to that. And that's what I think right. the complacency level 
of American wrestling right now. Um, outside of maybe the top senior guys, you know, the top, the top high school, the top national uh, college guys, everybody right. else is so complacent. They're like, ah, oh, I won. No, a 2-1 victory, unless you're wrestling a kid as good or better than you, is crap. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> and Matt wrestling, if you can conquer that, man, it makes wrestling a lot easier. No yeah. one's going to choose down on you. So there goes their quote-unquote free point that they always say in high school and stuff, you know. They're not going to choose bottom. They'll go back on their feet, and, you know, we'll get the takedown. We'll get it back up on top and end the match. It's the same thing in freestyle, you know, that I see. A lot of people are complacent and use the top. If they get the takedown, that's where they – they use as their kind of like rest period, take the 20 seconds, wait to go back up on their feet, get on top in the match and the match, and then go take your rest. I remember, you know, put the that, that 20 seconds of work in real quick. Exactly. You know, that's why, that's why the newcomer Dayton fix is so t- tough and freestyle too right now. He f- will turn you. That's a really good point actually. And I think, you know, the, the, mindset that we've had over the last couple of years, whether it's from like the way other people have been successful at the higher levels, you know, again, talking about like the Jordan Burroughs, the guys hitting takedowns. We don't, we, we don't take takedowns as an opportunity to get on top. People are taking takedowns as an opportunity to just simply score points. I know when I was growing up, our, our coach always told us your, your entire purpose of being on your feet is to get back on top. If you're on bottom. Your intention is to get back on top. And if you stand up and, and get an escape, then it's so that you could take them down and get back on top. And I don't right. know. I don't know when people strayed away from that. Like, when do you think that was? I don't know. It just. I mean, honestly, I don't know. It's just kind of how different people are taught. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are tough on top. It's just kind of where you come from a little bit, and more and more people just have to instill it. I think, and that's what I try to do. Well, whoever I'm around, no matter what style. But it's yeah. just everyone likes to be good and flash on their feet. You know, it's and it's a lot of work to hold somebody down for four or five minutes. You know, it, it is, but at the same time when you're good at it, it's really not. When you it's learn, not because now they're just trying to defend you instead of worrying about getting out. Exactly. Instead of about worrying what they have to do, and now they're worried about what is this guy gonna do to me? <laughs> exactly. Let me lay here and protect myself and I'll just lay on bottom and put my head down. So what do you think like in American folk style and freestyle on top is the biggest deficiencies that we have right now? Uh, probably more of a, like a hustle, a pride thing. I take a personal if I can't turn you. If I can't get you over in either style, I take a personal. I will get you over. I'll figure it out one way or another. Makes sense. Makes sense. Simple and enough. If you're going to defend it one way, I got another way that comes off the same series that I'll turn you back a different way. Exactly. That's, that's how I try to teach my kids too, is that, you know, if you do this right, their defense is going to lead to the next part of your move, you know, <coughs> right. make them do the right thing by doing the right thing. They should feed you exactly what you want. That's what anybody that's good on top should be teaching. So, you know, right. coaches, coaches that are listening, you know, don't just teach a few moves and don't just teach a quote unquote series, teach kids that, if they do X, the other guy is supposed to do Y. By doing that, that feeds you the move. And then if they pull it back, then you right. get the next one. And then you get the next one. That's how you teach chain wrestling. Don't, don't just teach a series of moves where you can connect the dots. Yeah, for sure. And then just how tight and hard we run stuff too, you know? I think that's a if big thing. If, it, if it's tight and I'm making you uncomfortable, Mike, guess what? You're going to go over or it's going to end up hurting you. So pick your battle. So... Tell me a little instead bit more of, you know, about Instead the... of guys just grabbing stuff, you know, like even like simple stuff, you know, like outside cradles and stuff. I do it hard enough where I'm going to make you uncomfortable. That way you want to roll yourself over and give up. And that, and doing that, it, it breaks guys mentally and be like, I don't want to be down there ever. You're a hundred percent And now they're really worried about what you're doing. You're a hundred percent correct. So tell me more, you know, one of the, one of the articles that just wrote for flow combat, one of the stages of breaking somebody is making them uncomfortable. So right. if you make them uncomfortable, tell, tell, tell us what that looks like on top. And then, you know, obviously like go into the, 
for you, it was go over or go out when you would lock up the strangler. But like, you know, it was like, say like either you're going to go over or it's going to hurt. So just kind of tell us how do we tactically make somebody more uncomfortable on top? And how would you define running things hard? Because kids drill terribly. They don't run things hard. It's like, oh, I don't want to hurt my partner. And it's like, it's not about hurting right. your partner. It's about, you, you got to learn how to do the move and they got to know what it feels like. So talk a little bit For more sure. about that. No, like you said, it's like drilling the moves. It's not like just drilling it and going through the motion where, yeah, I got it. Drilling it, drilling it tight so you know how it feels when you have to lock it up. I mean, especially when you're, you know, in practice, I don't want to hurt my partner or anything. But he needs to, he needs to tell you if it's, if it's tight enough. If he's just grabbing it and just setting back and, you know, and I'm not, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, it's not tight. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, go out there and break your partner, but you need to know how it feels so that when you go in that live match, you know how to lock it up correctly and make that guy uncomfortable, you know, hurting him a little bit so that he wants to roll over himself. Exactly. You know, I was funny. I'm glad you grunted. That's the, that's the example I use to my wrestlers all the time. I was like, listen, if, if when you're doing a move on top and the other guy doesn't go, Ugh! you're not doing it hard enough. So until well, your hey, it's not your problem. Moves, it's his problem. Yeah. Yeah. Until your partner makes, it's not your problem. Yeah, no, for sure. But even in the practice room, if your partner's not grunting, you didn't do it right. So right. don't, so don't be a jerk to your partner and hurt them. But no. absolutely, you need to put, you need to make them uncomfortable so that you know, okay, that's the right pressure. Oh no, a little more, a little less. Okay, cool. Right. That way, you know how to lock it up. Cor I mean, quote unquote, correctly. <laughs> for sure. Because if you just lock it up, I mean, yeah, you're gonna get so, especially little kids, you're gonna get those kids to go over. But as we start getting to the next stages in high school and college, international, wherever, it's got to be a lot tighter than just grabbing it and hoping he goes over. And that's pretty much what kids do. So I, I hope you guys – Nick, do you have any, like, DVDs or anything like that of your of some of your stuff? Uh, Not yet. I will here. I bet I will you will. Here, uh, this fall or something. Yeah, I'm I, getting all that stuff squared away with my wrestling room and stuff because I'm getting new mats and – very uh, cool. putting everything together right now yeah very cool so for those of you that haven't been to saw it's like a perfect example of what wrestling is you know it's like it's a in a warehouse in the lansing area and um you know there's a bunch of different colored mats put together but there's a hundred kids packed in a room why because wrestlers don't care necessarily about what color your mats are or you know what the wrestling room is, all it is is a place to grind. And when I went there and talked to your kids, you know, you said that was a small night and there was close to 70 kids on the mat. Yeah, no, it was good. No, I don't know. We appreciate They allowed you having you guys come out and everything. And I know you work with some of my kids personally too right now. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's great to be able to give back to, uh, great to be able to give back. And it was great to meet your parents and your kids. So moving on, um, I think Penn State has a similar mindset <coughs> to you on top, and their ability to get bonus points is a huge reason to their success every year in the national tournament. So when other wrestlers – what other wrestlers and teams do you think have shared your mindset, um, you know, throughout your time wrestling? Oh, man. I mean, a, you know, a bunch. That's how – you know, that's how a lot of the top teams live too. I mean, the NCAA is big – or, you know, whatever conference you're in, it's close. Bonus points is where you start to separate. That's where the best teams separate themselves from the rest of the pack or you, where you have to keep up. Bonus points, uh, you know, is a killer when it comes to that stuff or, you know, even team stuff, you know, regular dual mates. But, you know, obviously Penn State, that's what they, you know, they live on right now. You know, and all this, you know, Ohio State and those guys, you know, Iowa, uh, Oklahoma State, whoever, you know, Minnesota, they understand it and, the bonus points is what separates top teams. For sure. Who do you think, um, like, re like individual wrestlers over your career, maybe now, who, who do you think kind of embodies your similar mentality? I mean, there's a, you know, there's a bunch to name. You know, obviously right now, you know, David Taylor's that way. He was that way in college. You know, Ed Ruth was that way in college and stuff. You know, Kyle Dake was that way. But, I mean, there's just so many, you know, you got – the young up and comers are that way too, that you can see them wrestling with, you know, Spencer Lee and stuff, these guys. And it's just kind of how they've been instilled too, growing up a little bit. And you can see it with the coaching that they've had for sure. And who, it just carries on to the next level for sure. Who, um, when you were growing up, who was a guy that was tough on top that you looked up to? Oh man. 
I probably uh, more so looked up to Schultz. He was a, oh, with how mean he a, was in front headlocks yeah. and everything he did. He was a mean dude. Nice guy, mean dude. Yeah. So, so that's that's probably who I'd, I'd say the most, just because how mean he was. And if you take that to your Matt Russell, you know, it goes, goes hand in hand. Who was um, – what about Dave do you feel like was you, – you mentioned his front headlocks. What else? I mean, I know he used to defend a single with a Kimura, and they made it illegal oh, yeah. because he I do started that breaking <laughs> – <laughs> this, they they uh, they uh, started making it illegal. I think when guys started breaking their arms. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> hey, man, don't touch his legs. A- exactly, exactly. You don't want to get hurt. Don't touch his legs. Very good point. Um, <laughs> was there anybody else that you feel like you looked up to growing up, wrestling wise? Uh, I mean, uh, him most just because how mean he was, you know, and probably just someone else I looked up to was you know John Smith want to be that dominant in the world for sure for sure what about like guys like wade Shallis um and gene mills i didn't uh growing up i didn't know much about uh gene mills Shallis, yeah a little bit with his platos and stuff like that so what would you say you were more known for your splatles or uh your front headlights i'd say a combination of both yeah Man, that uh, I mean, I got the nickname from the front headlocks or reverse sure. headlocks. So, <laughs> the um, that picture, the, the the famous Splato picture. What country is that guy from? Moldova. Poor guy. You know, it's kind of like uh, the UFC fighter Jeremy Stevens when he was talking smack to Conor McGregor, and he was like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" And uh, yeah. that's pretty much what the guy from Moldova became. Like, he's only famous. Like, if anybody knows who he is, it's because, oh, you're the guy that got his, that got his crotch ripped off from Nixon. <laughs> his cousin te- her Facebooked me after that the next week. Did he really? What do you, what do you oh, have I to say? God. He goes, why'd you embarrass my cousin like that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I've, I've probably I told him, I go, you shouldn't have stepped on the line. I know. that. That's the thing, you know, you, you, you've coined a lot of those sort of phrases like, you know, either you go over or you go out. It, if it hurts, you can pin yourself, you know, and that's the – that's that next level. You know, we we'll talk about like predator mentality that people got to realize like you have to be that alpha on the mat. And if top posi- – I think there is no better place and no easier place than in the top position to completely right. dominate somebody. I mean it's the only position in wrestling where they start underneath you. They start oh, yeah. in a defensive position. Just blanket them. Suffocate them. Yeah, I mean it's the easiest make place to make somebody totally quit. Uncomfortable. Yeah, yes, easiest place is. to make somebody quit. I mean those you know MMA fighters that are listening. I mean think about it. If you're on top of somebody, isn't that where you want to be more than any place else? I don't even care if you're a boxer. You want to smother somebody, make them uncomfortable, get them on top. Yeah. So that's where they start making mistakes and freaking out. Exactly. So I had a. Um, we'll talk about this real quick. I didn't write it down in my questions, but speaking of using <laughs> the the king of breaking guys, I wrote six steps on how to break somebody. Um, in the article that I did recently. I'm going to pull it up real quick. So number one was, where did it go? Here it is. Okay. Number one, push the pace and the pressure. Number two, make them tired. Three, get them frustrated enough to make mistakes. Four, be aggressive and relentless. Five, step on their throat. Six, take their soul. There you go. So... I know I kind of left out making them uncomfortable. I guess I kind of like like frustrated, uncomfortable, kind of the same sort of thing. That kind of goes with pressure too. Yeah. So tell it's me, just creating that pressure. Exactly. So tell me, let's go one by one. So number one, push the pace and the pressure. How? What? What words would you? What uh, would you say about the importance of pushing pace and pressure, whether it be on top or just in wrestling in general? You know, pushing the pace. You know, it's obviously still moving forward keeping your hands on the guy where you're, you're in control of what's happening, but at the same time, making sure you're in position and not getting out of position, just running after the guy. Absolutely. So making them tired. How did you make people tired? Oh, man. Just pretty much just taking them down and wearing them out, wearing them out on top. I mean, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on my feet wrestling. I'm going to take you down, and then that's where you're going to get tired is underneath me. For sure. For those of you that, that don't know Nick, too, Nick, how tall are you? Uh, about 5'10". What weight did you wrestle in college? 125. Yeah, so Nick was a, a monster with these, 
long arms. But what I say that to say, those of you long guys, if you're not working on top, shame on you. Um, that's, I agree. <laughs> yeah, shame on you because that was Boy, every short. Yeah, that was every short guy's like nightmare was to have that long, lanky, good on top. I remember I was in high school and. Uh, my freshman year, there's a kid that beat me twice. I was up five nothing and seven nothing, and he came back to beat me six five and eight seven solely because he was like six feet tall, weighing 106 pounds, and it was so hard to defend him on top that he turned me. It's the only guy to turn yep. me like that in four years in high school. Oh yeah, man, length that leverage is a huge thing, especially you know you figure out how to use it. Absolutely. So you just got to figure out how to use it and make sure that you are using it. Cause it's exactly. Different kind of strength and long guys, and, uh, short guys. Listen, look at Zane Rutherford. He's short as hell. And, yep. and he's still probably the best. W- w- would you agree? Probably the best top wrestler right now. For sure. You know, I think For uh, sure. Jason Nolf had like 18 techs going into, um, NCAA tournament and Zane Rutherford had like 18 pins. Um, right. Like one decision. So the next one, get them frustrated enough to make mistakes. Tell me what it looks like to get somebody frustrated. Not, not just in top, but in general. Well, you, like you said, you get them frustrated enough to start making mis- mistakes. That's where all your, all your attacks can start evolving from. And, you know, if you're on your feet, that's where they just start diving in at your legs, or, you know, making easy go behinds, easy front headlocks, capitalizing on their mistakes. Cause either one, they're tired they're frustrated. They can't figure you out and get into you. For sure. Um, this is an important one for us. So aggressive and relentless. What does it mean in wrestling and then specifically on top to be aggressive and relentless? Uh, for me, it's all the same. You know, it's all relative. It's all the same. Feet, top, bottom, it doesn't matter. It's all – I am going to get the takedown. I am going to get on top, and then I'm going to end the match. It's just, it all goes hand in hand to me. You know, the aggressiveness, relentlessness, I'm going to score points one way or another. Even if I'm frustrating you and you're taking the shots, or if you're coming at me taking the shots, it's still going to be my attack. For sure. So, last one, step on their throat. What that kind of means is once you start getting somebody uncomfortable, tired, you feel them start to break. A lot of people kind of chill. You know, they score five, six points, and then they hang out. Stepping on their throat is, you know, you're shoving their face in the ground. In the, in the realm of war. Kind of like Mortal Kombat, just finish them. Exactly. In the, rel- in the, in the realm get of, it over with. In the realm of war, you know, if you're in battle, you don't just stab somebody once. You're going to stab them six, seven times so they're dead, bled out, and, you know, you watch them take their last breath. So tell me what that looks like for you. It's just, you know, just pretty much like you said, you know, you, you finish them off. Make that guy want to just roll over and be like, you know, I'm done with this. And I don't want to wrestle that guy again. Yeah. And just totally breaking him and making him just, you will see him quit. You can feel him quit. Jack Mueller used, uh, when I interviewed Jack, he talked about how you could feel them get weak on your hands. And I remember that. I tell people, I say, don't try to win a match. Wrestle to break somebody. That's way easier to win. If you're chasing, breaking somebody, you're probably scoring points along the way. And eventually, right. even if it takes two periods, once they quit, you can score 10 points in 30 seconds because it's over. For sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, them defending your first four or five attacks is easier. But once you get into 10, 11, 12, it starts to get harder for them. And once you break through, you'll feel it. That's kind of like what uh, Zahid Valencia said about his match against Alex Derringer. He said he was looking to take 100 shots, hoping to land five. He's like, there's no way he's going to be able to keep up with defending right. and defending and defending. And, you know, I didn't see the match, but from what I heard from the highlights and the interviews, it seemed like, you know, that's essentially how he broke, he broke Derringer down. For sure. You do enough attacks, you'll finally get through. It just, you can't lose that focus. Because if you stay not, relentless. What, 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 what great wrestlers, what good wrestlers, it's not going to be on your first attack unless you just totally catch them on their heels sleeping. You know, it's going to take four, five, six, ten attacks maybe to get to get through once. And then once, the, once you get the first one, it starts to get easier. For sure. So when, you know, obviously I, I laid out five, six ways to break somebody. If you were going to say in your own words – you know, hey, Nick Simmons, I want to break this guy. What do I need to do? What would you say? Uh, make them uncomfortable. Stay on them. Keep the pressure. If we make them uncomfortable, they will break. 
It's a my, sad my truth. My big thing is making everyone un- uncomfortable. And and whatever that means for that wrestler, you know, whatever your right, everyone's different, is. but you just got to figure it out for yourself how it's going to work for yourself. Exactly. It's exactly. same with the wrestling techniques I show the kids. You're not going to do it the same way as me, but figure out how you're going to make them uncomfortable for yourself with using the same basic technique. For sure. So um, moving on, you use a lot of your folk style moves and turns in freestyle. Can you talk about that and how being good on top in one style will help you in the other? Oh, it does. It translates. For me, it translates. It's, you know, wrestling's wrestling. You mo- don't matter the style. Get takedowns, don't get taken down. Get on top, you can still turn them the same way in any style. I mean, obviously, you're not locking your hands in folk style, but all your folk style moves translate over to freestyle. And like, like we said before, you know, I get on top of them looking to end the match and be done with it. And then bad stuff can't happen. You can't say, the, you know, the ref, the ref screwed you. You know, that guy doesn't have a chance to come back or get lucky or whatever you may want to say. If you get on top and end it and get in and out, nothing bad can happen. For sure. So <clears throat> let's get into some kind of deeper questions. Um, you were four-time All-American in Michigan State. You placed fifth mm-hmm. at the World Championships. You've beaten NCAA champions, Olympic champions, and still known as one of the meanest guys in wrestling to this day. Um, when I was getting ready for this interview – I was just looking at some old clips, and uh, it was an old flow commentary where Jake Herbert was on. I think it was your match against Logan Stieber. And Jake, as big as he is, said, your front headlock was the one place he'd never want to be. Like, if there was one place in wrestling, he'd never want to be underneath Nick Simmons in a front headlock. Um, so but I know I did something right then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so but my, my point is, as feared as you were, as good as you were, you never made it past the semis in the NCAAs, you know, even sometimes nope. when you were the better wrestler. So looking back, what do you attribute those losses to outside of just getting beat? Uh, I don't know. I, it was the same thing at Worlds. I lost in the semis at Worlds, too. So, I, you know, it's just stuff happens, and, you know, and all, all of those matches were to guys that never beat me till then. I think one of them I beat 12 times. You know, but uh, it's just <coughs> something that happened. Uh, my my wife thinks it's something in my head after the after the semifinals at Worlds, <laughs> which you may be right, but you know it is what it is, and you live and learn and teach you try to teach your guys and your club through the same situations that you've been in. For sure. Do you think that maybe like once you get to the semis, you have this like struggle of of you know, man, if I win this, I make the finals. If I lose, I'm on the backside because like in in Big Tens, you won Big four times? Three times, yeah. Yeah, so obviously, like, Big Tens didn't stress you out. But when you got to the NCAAs and the World Championships, being in the semifinals, you know, maybe carried a little bit more weight. Have you ever thought about, like, you know, maybe treating those sort of matches a little bit special and making yourself maybe a little bit nervous or, or wrestling a little more cautious? Did you ever see yourself thinking about anything like that? No, not, not that I can remember in particularly. It's just, you know – just different situations in the matches which end up turning the match, you know. You know, when I lost to Coleman, I got caught me for four off the start and I had to try to fight back and ended up losing by one, you know. And my fir- my first time in the semifinals, I was actually up 5 nothing after the first period. They flipped the coin. I choose top. Side judge grabs the ref and they take all my points away. So then right there and then your mentality, for that match, my mentality switched. And that got in my – that's probably what got in my head the most during that match. For sure. What about the – I mean, it was never the fear of, like, being on the backside. Yeah, well, I guess that not necessarily be on the backside. It's like, hey, you know, having – a lot of people in the semis do the semi slide. You know, they, they yeah. make it to the semis and then they take six because they have all this pressure to make the finals and then they lose and they're deflated and then now they're not the same wrestler that got them to the semis. Right. No, for sure. That You see that happen a lot. But, you know, it it shows what kind of person you are, though, too, not to do that. Or what kind of competitor. For sure. So what was the highest place that you had at NCAAs? Third. And – 7443. Yep. So if you would do anything differently, maybe in some of those matches, what what would it be? Uh, Probably just – stick with my gut and do what I know what I should have been doing in the first place instead of changing the way I wrestled a little bit. 
how did you change the way that you wrestled in some of those matches? Well, the first one I lost when I chose top. After they had their discussion, they took all my points away. Uh, I switched my choice and chose bottom. Oh, wow. Yep, that'll do it. That so I sense. would have stayed on top. For sure. For sure. What about any other ones? Any other ones stick out in the, in the back of your head? Uh, that one the most. I mean, it's just, you know, in those moments and stuff, you make little mistakes and uh, other guys capitalize on it. For sure. I mean, you're at the highest level in college wrestling. You know, that's really what's You know, they're all coached great. You know, everyone, you know they're coached great, too, in that time, and they made the adjustments. And it is what it is. I got gotcha. you. So, <clears throat> moving on. The, there are a lot of tough wrestlers, but not a lot of them are resilient. Tough wrestlers push past being tired, fight through injuries. Resilient wrestlers are able to bounce back from adversity, beat guys they're not supposed to beat, and control their emotions. Who do you think are the most resilient wrestlers uh, in the game right now? Well, JB, for one. That's for he sure. He obviously is. Yeah, with all the, you know, whatever he, the pressures he has to deal with and stuff, and all the Russians and Iranians gunning for him all the time, you know, or even, you know, Chenzo coming up and stuff like that. He, I'm sure, you know, Schneider, you know, him – you know, kind of having to having to beat the Russians for Team USA to win the world title. I mean, there's a lot of pressure right there, especially when you're wrestling pound for pound, the best guy in the world with you. Yes, yeah, wild. That's wild right. to think of that. There's a lot, a lot of, a lot of intense situations right there. Agreed. But you rise above it. Great competitors, you know, know how to do it and block it all out and just r wrestle their match. What did you do to help yourself block out emotions? Like, was, you know, did you take deep breaths? Was there, you know, did you, did you find yourself, like, doing something when you would start to lose your cool to kind of, like, calm yourself down? During a match? No, not really. I don't – I never really lost my cool during, like, when I was wrestling. Beforehand, it was just more our personal coach would just joke with us. He'd be telling jokes on the side before I wrestled. Keep it light. Yeah, he'd be messing with me. I think that's with a Andy. Thing. With Andy, he didn't do that because Andy was Andy's totally different mindset than me. With me, he'd just keep it light and be telling jokes with me, for sure. Yeah, we'll actually talk about your brother here in a second. I got some questions about Andy. Um, so you were a college coach for a while, and when you were recruiting, what kind of mindset did you look for in incoming recruits? Like what? And then and then similarly, what kind of mindset would turn you off of a good recruit? There are plenty of good wrestlers that don't get recruited the way that you would think. Right. I mean, one thing, you know, everyone wants, you know, the best kid that they can get, the best kid in the nation, right? But then on, on the other side of it, too, you look at how they carry themselves as a competitor, you know, on and off the mat. And they get knocked in the backside. How are they going to – how are they going to react? How are they going to come back from wrestling on the backside of the bracket? That tells a, that can tell you a lot about how, how a kid is, too, mentality-wise. I agree. Because, I mean, like you said, you get knocked on the backside, you don't plan on being there and it don't happen a lot, you know, it shows what kind of character and mindset you do have. For sure. If you were going to name, you know, let's say a couple traits that as a college coach or just in general as a coach now, like I want my wrestlers and I want their mindset to reflect this. Like what would be a couple words you would say? Dominant. Have a little bit of, you know, arrogance prick in them. When they're wrestling, be the dick. Might as well be, and be on the mat, but not off. Yep. You know that always helps, man. If guys fear you, it helps. Absolutely, because they're already beat before they step out there. For sure. Anything else? I mean, those you know between that and just how they can, like I said, you know how they carry themselves in the match, and I particularly like a little bit of longer guys too. I bet you do. I bet it's you a little do. bit easier to teach them a lot more of my funk. <laughs> um, you also work with a bunch of MMA guys too. What, what's what's that like? Because I work with some of the guys that you work with, and I was like, so what happens when you go over to Nick's? And they're like, well, we pretty much just wrestle, and he beats the living crap out of me. <laughs> Got to get them back to their wrestling roots. You're Straight right. Off, you know. Got to do what uh, got them there. You keep evolving, just like Russell, and you keep evolving, but you stay with what got you there. 
I try to don't tell. Change, don't change who you are. Yes, I tell wrestlers that all the time, and I tell. There's one wrestler in particular. I mean, at, a lot of my, they they try to tell me that my splittles weren't going to work after high school. But stick with who you are. If you if you're great at it, keep doing it. Evolve around every evolve around it though. And that's what I try to tell them while we're wrestling with those guys. I'm like, get back to your roots. Ben Askren says, dance with the girl that brought you there. Right. Yep. Very true. Very true. Um, so you run a <laughs> club back at home called Simmons Wrestling Academy. Uh, Academy of short. Wrestling. S- Simmons Academy of Wrestling. I don't know why I keep saying Simmons Wrestling Academy. Uh, so, Simmons Mike, Academy, you know that. The, I, I know. I, I, uh, <laughs> apparently, I can't spell. So, Simmons Academy of Wrestling, saw for short. Um, I was in the room, and it was packed from end to end. Um, you know, again, what's the mindset that you're trying to instill in these kids, whether they're young to old, to help them be successful? I mean, it's not even just on, off the mat, it's on, you know, or on the mat, it's off the mat as well with it. You know, you're helping young kids, high school kids, you know, evolve into, you know, young men or women. It's just the mentality you have to have on the mat is kind of go with life too. If you want it, attack it, go for it. Can't be scared of what's going to happen. If you think you're not going to win, those doubts, you're probably not going to, or it's going to be a lot harder to win. For you sure. Know, and it's just trying to get that stuff out of there. And so if we stick with the dominant, a dominant mindset, it makes things, wrestling, life a little bit easier. I agree with you. I feel like, you know, you shoot for the moon, hope for the stars. If you go to it, if you attack everything, uh, every obstacle in your way, it's a lot easier to get a lot farther a lot quicker. Instead of waiting um, for it to maybe fall in your lap and get lucky. Exactly. And that's what a lot of people do in wrestling matches, too. They wait to see what's going to happen. No, go take it. Got to take it. Because guess what? If not, that guy's going to take it. Yep. And especially if he's a good wrestler. He's, he's, he's going to be hunting stuff, too. You know, I was at World Team Trials in Akron this weekend. And every high-level guy went, went, like, went exactly what they wanted for. And they went and took it. Um, right. I watched Jack Mueller uh you know destroy Rayvon Foley in the finals. The first match was close. He made adjustments and he went and went go 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 go. He took what he wanted, took, 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 and didn't stop till he got it. Yeah. So it's just those mentalities, you know, and that's what I try to keep with the kids. For sure. Don't don't sit back and wait for it. I know it's easier said than done, but if we keep working on it, it you it'll eventually click. Absolutely. Um, Some faster than others. Absolutely. So your brother, recent Andy, recently came out of retirement, um, and he's been doing really well. So I have a couple questions about that. Number one, you said that your brother was uh, has a very different mindset than you. What, what 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 was his mindset different than your own? Oh man, that you thought I was mean. That dude's more of a prick than I am. Really? <laughs> yeah. He was just always hurting stuff, you know. Now he's had, you know, ten years off. His body's finally healed, so he's training full go right now. You know, that dude works 60 hours a week, too. But uh, he just more, uh, wasn't a more joking around with him. It's just more focused and just, just let him be right there. Don't bother him. Gotcha. Well, how would you describe, how would you describe his mentality when he wrestled? Oh, same, man. He'll dra- He'll drag it out in the street if he has to. You know, I'm more kind of, I do it more in my wrestling, but Andy will drag it out in the street. So he was, you know, he, he was a little style, bit more ruthless. Style, he's more of like a, a hammer, go forward guy, you know. It, we don't, obviously, if anyone, you've watched us wrestle, we don't wrestle anything alike. Right. Growing up in the same system. It's interesting how that works. Oh, yeah. Like I said, man, you learn the same basics, but he's not going to do it the same way I am. I'm not going to shoot a double leg the same way you're going to do it. The same basics will be there, but the way we do it, it's going to be a little bit different. Absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> last thing, um, I know you've mentioned kind of thrown out maybe uh, coaching in college again. Um, would you ever consider yourself taking another co- coaching job or something along those lines? I mean, never say never. The opportunity is right, and it's there. You know, I would consider it, but uh, I just kind of, I kind of go day by day, and got a good thing going on here right now. So, if it happens and it's right, then it's right. You got to do what's best for your family at this point. For sure. And speaking of, um, 
could we ever see you putting on a singlet again? What do you think? I don't know. That involves training. <laughs> <laughs> it involves a lot of hard work. I don't know if I want to do anymore. Yeah, I would. It's I like would going love, in the room and wrestling with the dudes. I would love to see. I would love to see what Flo's reaction is when you like randomly register for the U.S. Open, and they're I like, mean, "I only weigh one thirty-five, so I'm right down to fighting weight." That would that would be hilarious. I remember when they were saying, you know, they were surprised to see a couple people enter the U.S. Open this past year, and like, can you imagine everybody at like your weight class to find out like. Nick Simmons is here? Shit, really? <laughs> Why not? It's like, I know the fun. dude's old, but man. <laughs> He's getting I, up there. I know. Uh, how old are you now? 35. Man, well, at least you don't look it. I try not to feel it either. See, I don't know about that. I, I feel every bit of my age, if not more, every day. I do sometimes, too. That's another reason I don't really know if I'd want to do that again. Yeah, it's you know, I uh, I started competing in jiu-jitsu because well, Andy body... tried talking me into it, you know, T- tried to uh, compete. Yeah, you're still you're good. crazy. You're so you can good. do it. I'll go. I know that's not the point. It's the amount of pain and the amount of time that it takes to get to where you want to be because you don't want to go in there with uh, with a half ass training camp. Right. I feel you. I feel, you know, uh, I think a lot of us wrestlers are in the same boat. So as we wrap up the interview itself, before we get into what I call the mindset quick fire, is there anything else that you wanted to leave with, um, leave with uh, the, the, the listeners here? Anything you want to tell us? Any upcoming things you have coming up? Just uh, take pride in your mat wrestling as much as you do on your feet. It's all a pride thing. That's what I tell my kids. That's actually that's a very good point. Pride is a lot of what it has to do. I, I, I tell kids all the time. You know, you got pinned last weekend. I was like, if I told you I was going to take away your phone for a year, would you ever go to your back again? Like, no. Well, then why'd you get pinned this weekend? You have no pride. You have no pride. You chose to get pinned. Getting pinned is a choice. Just like going over is a choice or not going over. You know, you have a choice. Either you go over when you wrestle Nick Simmons, either you go out or you go over. (laughs) So you could could choose. I mean, I'd rather go out. And then as long as they don't disqualify me, I'll, I'll come back. Right. For sure. All right. So um, as we go into this quick fire, it's about nine, ten questions, uh, specific mindset related. And, Are they A, uh, B? N- uh, no. Can I say uh, like A, B, like on a test? <laughs> l- l- or more, neither? L- neither. A little more open-ended. A little <laughs> more open-ended. So, But you, can, you don't have to get into too much detail. Pretty straightforward stuff. So um, what is the importance of mindset? Obviously, we talk about wrestling being a very mental sport. How would you, what would you say is the importance of mindset in wrestling and could you, and are you able to quantify it? What is it? Just not, everyone's got a breaking point. Just not, uh, if you get to it, not letting it bring you down. Just keep, you learn from it and keep going. You know, you just can't let that be like, well, and then just keep going south from there. I mean, everyone has those times. It's just how you pick yourself back up. For sure. If, if you were to put a percentage on mental versus physical in wrestling, what would it be? Oh, right. 70, 30? For sure. For sure. So obviously 80, like... 20, 7, 25, you know, 75, 25 right in there. Yeah, a lot. A lot, which is one of the craziest things, you know, being, having wrestling mindset available and kids talk about how wrestling and sport parents and, and coaches talk about how wrestling is 90% mental, 75% mental. But they don't really do anything to train their mindset. I made a post the other day. I said the difference between motivational speech and mindset training is motivational speech gives you hope. Uh, mindset training gives you hope with tools. You know, we're, right. we're, we're long gone from the days where you and I grew up and toughness just got us through a lot of things. This is no longer that generation. So, no, for sure. You know, it's just unless... getting them to instill that back again. Exactly. Well, you know, I watched your room. Your room is run like like the rooms we grew up in in 1996. Got to keep a how I know. <laughs> Very true. So uh, we cover different topics in wrestling mindset. There are curriculums broken down that way. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to name some topics, and I want you to tell me what you think is the most important part of a wrestler's mindset. Self-knowledge, confidence, relaxing under pressure, aggressiveness uh confidence confidence so why why confidence because you're not having those doubts when you go out there 
got to have the confidence. If you're doubting yourself or saying a what if game before you go out there or during any point in the match, you don't know what's going to happen. Tell my guys, you should be able to spot that guy six, eight, ten points and have no problem beating him. And that's what my dad would always tell me to tell us. What would he say? Say that again. You should be able to spot that guy 14 points and still beat him. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, I think wrestlers, again, wrestlers are just trying to, wrestlers are just trying to win. I know, I know I tell my guys, I said, once you hit five, nothing scores tied, you know, like once you hit five, nothing, then it's zero, zero. But if you're not hitting elite, at least five points, if not six to where you should be able to make a five point mistake and come For back. Sure. For sure. The ref should it, be able it to shouldn't, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't fluster you. You just no. be like, all right, now I got work to do. Exactly. You should be, you should be, you know, the ref could be able to make a terrible call that ends you up. Like, you should be able to get thrown completely out of bounds for five and still be okay to come back and, oh, sure. and feel I, good. It happened, my first, my first tournament in high school, first, uh, it was my first, not even duels, just first straight competition in high school and the finals I got taken down to my back off some goofy stuff where we got caught and tripped I was down 5 nothing, and ended up winning 7-5 crazy how that works can you imagine if that guy uh, ruined your undefeated season first week of, first, first week of high school oh yeah I hit, I hit him with a slide by and our feet got tangled up and he ended up with a single leg and then I went to grab his wrist and duck it and he cradled me right to my back Luckily, I was able to uh, get off and get out of bounds and then ended up winning 7-5. Crazy. Um, so, pre-match, did you have a specific pre-match routine that you did before you wrestled? Uh, I mean, I always wear uh, my wrestling necklace, my pendant. Whoever I gave it to, I have to give it to every time. It's just my little superstition, but that's about it. Was there like a, like a list of exercises or th- or drills nope. that you would do? Nope, not at all. I just go out there relaxed. Cool. Well, once I, re- I already got my well, once I got my warm up, I'm good. Maybe loosen my neck up a little bit again before I go out there. But other than that, nothing. Yeah, everyone's different for sure. Um, Greg Jones, obviously, you remember him, three time NCAA champ. Yep. Um, good friend of mine. He's uh, my partner in the martial arts mindset, and uh, we wrote an article. And he talked about how the uh, the guys at the highest level, you're supposed to get nervous. If you don't get nervous, something's wrong. You know, if you don't feel some sort of butterflies, you know, um, right. that's 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 the that's usually weird. That's different. Point being is that it's okay to get nervous. You just have to it embrace is. it. You have to embrace it. You have to project those nerves on your opponent and use it for fuel. So did you get nervous, and how did you deal with it? Uh, I didn't really get nervous, you know, because I've been doing it since I've been five years old at a national level. It wasn't really the nerves. It was more the – I mean, I guess you could call it nerves. It's just more excitement, like I'm ready to do it. Like, let's go type, type of mentality. I guess you can associate it with nerves a little bit. I wouldn't say I got, like, nervous, but it was just more like, all right, let's go out there, let the whistle blow, and then we'll be good. Well, it's kind of like you felt those feelings, but instead of letting it bring you down, you're like, oh, it just means I'm ready to wrestle. Right. And that's just how you, how you perceive it and how you turn it, what you turn it into. The hero and the coward feel the exact same thing. The difference is, is that the hero uses it for something positive. So – we have a worksheet where literally we do that. We have the kids redefine nervousness to where they can, you know, yeah. understand that, okay, the clammy hands, the butterflies. I feel that every time before I wrestle, no matter who it is, but that doesn't mean that I'm nervous. That just means, Oh, my <coughs> body is ready to wrestle. Like it's, For sure. it's, it's my sympathetic nervous response. Your body was like, Oh, you're about to do something that requires confidence. So I'm going to put like, and hard work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's just preparing itself for battle. For sure. And I, and I was always like, man, now it's time to put on a show. So what was your biggest win? You beat a lot of great guys, won a lot of big tournaments in high school and college, uh, placed at the World Championships. What was your biggest win? Oh, man, I don't know. Or name, could... name, name like a few of your favorite wins. How about that? I mean, probably, you know, one of the top ones, obviously, beating Cejudo in the – 
in the Olympic trial finals in Iowa City. But it's kind of a moot point because I didn't make the team. That's probably one of the bigger wins. I, For you know, sure. Beating, beating Hazelwood because of the year before to get to get on the world team, you know. And as many times as we wrestled and us beating them, this is. So, but, you know, I beat, I mean, besides Henry and stuff, you know, the guy that beat me in the world in the world semis that's a world champ I pinned him you know a month leading up into it crazy crazy so I was going to ask I guess about losses what was your toughest loss Olympic trials or yeah Olympic trials in the finals Olympic I would probably tri- say that yeah against Hayeswinkle yeah I would say that what about in college well, which, which... and I was on the, I was on the team for about 30 you know, 30 seconds till they threw the challenge brick out there and they switched the call. <laughs> wow. So that was probably the hardest to try to bounce back from. Yeah, I bet, man. I bet. Um, what was your biggest regret in, in competing? Biggest regret? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know if I really have any regrets. I kind of left it all out there. That's why uh, I'm not doing it anymore. So you feel at peace with leaving competition behind? I guess you could say that. Yeah. You're at peace. I mean, did I accomplish what I knew I was able to the whole time? No. But I don't regret doing what I did. For sure. So um, I'm looking here. I'm looking here. Next question, max effort. What does giving a max effort mean to you? Oh, man. You know, it's a tough question for anybody because everyone's going to be a little bit different. You know, some people are going to say your max effort was at 120% or whatever. Is there such thing as over 100%? But as long as you leave it out there and you know you gave it all you could have during that match or competition, you shouldn't have that regret of, you know, if it didn't go your way. Now we just got stuff to work on if you wrestled your max effort, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. So like, if you were to, if you were to like make it tangible, like say if you, if you have a wrestler that's about to compete, what would you consider a max effort to look like in neutral top and bottom? Then I know you're looking to score points in every position and dominate whether we do or don't not getting to your breaking point. I mean, we could still break that guy even if we do end up losing that match. So, as long as you, like you said, you know, as long as you, you left it all out there, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Absolutely. Um, what what did max effort look like for you when you wrestled? Getting bonus points. Getting bonus points. Making that dude uncomfortable and cringe. For sure. Uh, what does it mean to be aggressive and relentless? Aggressive and relentless could be, you know, on my take, is going after the fall at all times. Not sitting back waiting for it. Not sitting back waiting to run the score up. Absolutely. Do what you can to build, to build the lead. And still your dominance. For sure. So something that we talked about um, a lot at Wrestling Mindset is gratitude. You know, I did that podcast with Kyler Sanderson. I've talked a lot about, uh, to Brad Pataki about it. And gratitude um, is what Penn State considers their mental edge. It's what a lot of high-level athletes, like if you talk to them, they really consider that to be um, the key to their success. So gratitude is also the opposite of depression. Gratitude allows us to give greater perspective. Uh, it makes wrestling not necessarily everything because we're just thankful for the opportunity to wrestle. So what is the importance for gratitude in your life, and what are some things that you're grateful for? Uh, you know, just grateful that I was, you know, that I had the the support system that we did to be able to get where we're, uh, where we we're at and where I'm at today. And that was part of the, you know, part of the, 
the help reason why I was able to move home like I did too. For sure. Start the academy, you know. For sure. Just the support, the background, family, friends, or whoever it may be, that they're there if I need anything. For sure. For sure. And then the – did you feel like gratitude had any sort of impact on how you wrestled? You know, being thankful to wrestle? Like, because you really – because you loved wrestling. So being thankful for the opportunity to wrestle. Oh, yeah. I mean, like you say, just being out – be able to get out there – or travel and doing all the stuff or wherever it leads you throughout the world and country, just being able to get out there and represent, you know, your family or your state or your country. I mean, not everybody gets to do that. Absolutely. So you just go out there and represent yourself and everybody as best as you can. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, lastly, what was your mental edge when you competed? You're, that I know you're afraid to go underneath me. That's very true. <laughs> That's a very good point. That's a very good point. So tell me a little bit more about that. It, like, say your mental edge. I know I got you. I know I got you beat before we even step on the line, because you're going to change your wrestling to the way I wrestle. I won't change to how you wrestle, because I'm still going to do what I do. Now you have to shift your wrestling around me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's awesome. If I change, if I if I change my wrestling now, I'm out of now I'm out of my head and my what I do best. But I'm gonna make you change the way I wrestle. Absolutely. And I'll give you one more question. You know, we talk about the predator wrestler quite a bit. You know, being the predator wrestler, the predator mentality. What does the, what does the predator mentality mean to you? How would you define it? Just that, just like we've been pretty much talking about the whole time. You know, just going out there to dominate. I am going to score points. Can you keep up is the thing. Can you score as many as I am? Because I know I'm going to score 10, 20 points. Can you do it as well? Yeah, a lot of guys probably can't say that, especially, you know, if, uh, if, if, if they can't take you down and they can't get out, I'm not sure how they plan on winning. Right. And I got moves to end the match. Do you? Very true. You do. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, Nick, man, it was great to it was great to hear from you. Obviously, you and I talk quite a bit on a regular basis, and it's 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 nice to kind of pick your brain and get the get the um, the public to hear from you. You know, it's uh, for any wrestling historian, for lack of a better word, everyone knows who you are. But maybe this generation of kids, they haven't heard what it was like to to have somebody so feared on top. They haven't heard what your career looked like, and I think. For those of you wrestlers and coaches and parents that can share this with your with your friends, I encourage you to. I encourage you to take some advice from what Nick said. You know, if there's top five guys on top ever of all time, Nick's in there. So I encourage you to make sure to adapt some of the ways you train, some of the ways you think, and, uh, you know, hopefully some of the ways that you compete. So, again, Nick, thank you for uh, coming on today. I appreciate your help. Best of luck continuing at your academy. And I look forward to seeing your brother do well, uh, you do well, and I'll see you next time I'm in Michigan, brother. All right, sounds good. Thanks for having me, bud. All right, thanks. Thank you for joining us on the Wrestling Mindset Podcast. Until the next time. Thanks, guys. Heart, wait, is, don't get fed the night before.